My Gavan and Melonine, and well met indeed. I'm Adak here, Galadirthin, head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer. And welcome back as we continue on with the faction overviews for version 4 slash 4.5. There are only three left. Uh, today, dealing with Canned. So the starting size when playing as the Variags of Canned is average. You've got Sterlatsep, Amu, Kizilkum, to the north Oibamari, and to the west, far to the west, Chelkar. So you have five regions to begin the game, and the army size within them, though, is relatively small and very minor. There's a couple of units in with Stolutza, but otherwise, as you can see, there's not much at all in the settees in terms of army. So gathering an army will take a little bit of time. Um, you do have a number of custom generals, though, so your faction leader, Khan Arkish, uh, he... Oh, actually, no, you don't, because you're a cavalry nation, and generally speaking, cavalry nations, it's too OP to give them anything other than their own bodyguard. And so that is what they start with. So Khan Arkish, your faction leader, comes with Variag Nobles. And I think every other general also comes with Variag Nobles. Oh, no, indeed. Apart from your faction heir, Warlord Orash, who comes with Wind Riders of Kand. So he is actually arguably your best general because he doesn't have the drawbacks of being a cavalry archer. Uh, so he'll be someone that you'll use a lot, and you'll probably want to make him your leading general. That leads on to the family tree. It's relatively extensive. Warlord, or Khan Arkish, sorry, leads your faction over there, married to Oina. And Warlord Orash is the son, and there's Kemik soon to come of age as well. Um, Khan Arkish's brother-in-law, Togrul, um, is part of the family tree, and his son, Sharia, will come of age in 15 years. And then finally to Louis, um, the son of Iltig again. So there's quite a few generals to begin the game with. Uh, interestingly, Kaf, um, who is one of your generals, I've never seen... I didn't know we'd set the family tree up like that. The f Your faction leader's wife's husband, her father, is still alive, which is something you just really rarely ever see. So that's quite cool, I think, actually. Uh, but anyway, so that's the family tree. Um, the victory conditions when playing as canned are to hold 40 regions, including your capital. So again, you have um, a sort of neutral victory condition, and that will become quite apparent in only a little while. Um, you shouldn't be able to hear the ridiculously loud noise outside the window at the moment, but if you can, I apologise for that. Someone is cutting something. So the area that you're in, of course, is a very secure location. Canned, uh, apart from the Blue Wizard script, which will, of course, deal with the most of this part of the video, Canned have quite possibly the most boring and easiest start in the game. And I say that with bias, making you all think it's boring on purpose. I dislike Canned's setup, and I would like them to be different. Um, and I, I mean, do not hide that fact at all. If you play as Canned, the Blue Wizards are about the only thing you have to look forward to, because the area that you start in is about as far away as it's possible to be from any actual front. Dorwinian way to the north, and Gondor and Dol Amroth way to the west. Um, so unless you turn on your allies, those that start around you, then the campaign will be a bit of a doddle. Speaking of other reasons why it might not have that much going on, is there aren't any custom settlements around this area apart from your own nation's custom settlements. So Canned do have their own settlements on the battle map and indeed on the campaign strategy map, which is very cool. And it does lend itself to the faction quite nicely. But there aren't any unique one-off locations around here. The nearest being all the way up here with barad uh, So what I'm trying to get to is that the starting game for Canned might be a little tedious. And you've got to sort of work your way through it. So of the people around you then, you are allied to the Haradrim tribes to the south, Rune to the north, and Mordor to the west. You do not um, start allied to the Ar Ardenaim, so they um, pose potentially a threat all the way down there. Um, you'll note that you are at war with only Gondor at the start, you aren't at war with Dol Amroth, so that's if you want to attack them, you can, but that is up to you. Moving on then to... Um, your how the faction plays with buildings and whatnot you are technically speaking set up like a wildman faction so what that means is you do not have access to top tier uh, castles or cities you can upgrade to a castle but you can't get a stronghold and you can only upgrade to uh, in cities to a large town so Sterlatsakand is actually the largest it's going to ever be, and indeed that is the largest any of your towns will ever be unless you've captured a better town from someone else. So you're a very nomadic style people, you don't get big settlements. 
um, which does of course then hinder your ability to make money because you don't get the top tier buildings either. Uh, so certain buildings will be locked off. When it comes to guilds, Warriors Guild, you get the Nomads Guild and then Warlords Brotherhood, so the Brotherhood name did survive, at least in part. Uh, and again, it's just the same as every other one, a melee bonus and then a morale bonus. You get a Horse Breeders Guild, because of course you are keen horse riders, uh, and the Master Horse Breeders Guild is a top for yourselves, which gives you Variac Horse Archers, and of course makes all your cavalry train faster. Uh, the Horse Breeders Guild just makes your cavalry train faster. Your note can do not get the third tier, and that is because the third tier is reserved for Rohan only, to again further cement Rohan as the quintessential cavalry faction. They're the only ones who actually get the top tier cavalry guild. Your diplomat comes out of Sterlatzakand, and he comes from... Oh, actually, where does your diplomat come from? Or is this about to reveal a bug for Cairn? Do you even get a diplomat? I'm not sure that you you do. Um, no, I don't think you do as Cairn, actually. I think in order to get a diplomat, you start with Tordan, but then to actually get another one, you've got to conquer um, some a diplomat from somewhere else. Um, and that's just a limitation on the game. We deliberately limit diplomats because the AI just goes crazy with diplomats. So unless we restrict them, which we do, to two per nation, unless you've captured someone else's capital, the then the AI only has two diplomats. They can't go mad with it. Um, but if they're allowed to build as many as they can, they just flood you with diplomats, and it's really annoying, and a massive waste of their money as well. Uh, so, unfortunately for Cairn, because there's no unique building in Stelatza Cairn, that's how we could solve it. We could just give you a unique building here. But at the moment, it looks as though you can't actually train a diplomat until you've captured a capital from someone else. You are not a nation that gets ships, you are not seafarers, I am afraid, um, but you do get the advanced blacksmith because you're a very non-advanced people. You are nomads, and master crafting is not something that you really have any skill over. So then that leads us on to the gameplay events of Canned, and that of course entirely is the Blue Wizard script. So I've written down what happens in the Blue Wizard script, but unfortunately the script is incredibly detailed and convoluted and I didn't want to have to spend about an hour just working out when the turns are because I do not, I simply do not know what turns they actually come in at. But the basic premise of the Blue Wizard script is, is thus. You will get a message, I think around turn 40, and it just says, We've heard rumour that the Blue Wizards, Palando and Alatar, are coming back from the Far East, and they are bringing with them an army of Orokani Dwarves. They have sent messengers forward to us to try and persuade us that Sauron's will and Sauron's path are false, and we should instead side with the Free Peoples and rid the world of Sauron. We will have to face them if we refuse. So basic premise, the Blue Wizards will return, they will lead a large army, and you will be given the option of joining them or fighting them. That's the first point. Now, if you join with the Blue Wizards, you this is the side of good. You will side against Sauron. You will go to war with everyone around you, Harad, Sauron, and Mordor, uh, and Mordor, and Rune. Um, and more importantly though, your cities will then rebel against you, which is supposed to be a bit of a surprise, but um, I'm just giving you all the information. So your core cities, being Chelkar, Kizilkum, Amukand and Oibamari, will all rebel against you if you side with the Blue Wizards. This is um, written off as basically not all of your population are actually all that keen on suddenly deciding that you're going to be good now, and they're not particularly happy that the whole world has declared war on you. So they break away from your leadership and they're going to go it on their own. So then you have to quell the rebellions. Also, if you side with the Blue Wizards, your culture changes. So at the moment you are men of the East, which means that if you captured Harad or Rune's lands, you'd be able to train things straight away. But if you side with the Blue Wizards, you do away with your evil roots and you join and, or you, and then you return to your non-aligned roots and you become nomadic. So at the moment you can build the Dark Shrine, which improves your uh, culture down this route of Men of the East. But when you side with the Blue Wizards, you lose all your shrines and your culture swaps to Nomadic. And that is not all. If you also side with the Blue Wizards, Sauron will not be too happy. And not only will he declare war on you, he will also send an Inquisitor at the head of a large and very powerful Dark Numenorean army that will spawn. The Inquisitor's name is Ankanta. He comes with Temple Knights as his bodyguard. And they will spawn near Stalatzakand and try and crush you. 
But you're not alone in all this because you've sided with the Blue Wizards and so the two large dwarven armies that they are leading will join you. Now they don't actually come in together, they come in staggered. I think they're about five turns apart possibly. But you get two large armies of dwarves. And you get each blue wizard. Now, Palando has Blacklock um, Engineers, which is a crossbow unit. And Alatar has Iron Fist Hammers, who are a very good shock infantry unit. So you get two very big armies, but you have to f you lose a lot of your core regions. Your culture changes, which means it'll take a while for you to be able to field armies again. And you're attacked by Mordor quite significantly through Ancanta. And you go to war with Harad, Mordor and Rune. Um, but if you manage to, to make it through all of that, it is said to be remarkably challenging and lots of people do lose if they side with the Blue Wizards because they just can't overcome the odds. But also lots of people win, so we think it's in about a good place to be honest. It is challenging. Uh, but if you manage to survive it all, you unlock the ability to train the Orokani Dwarves. Um, they come from the Orokani Hall, which is available if you play as Erebor as well. Unfortunately, I can't show you because it's script locked and script locked it locked buildings do not show uh, although the Inquisition one does so that's quite interesting oh no, no it's right there I'm talking out of my proverbial uh, the Orokani clan hall so you unlock the Orokani clan hall you get stiff beard archers stonefoot spearmen and then there's a second tier as well which you can see there um, which gives you warriors and iron fist hammers now the Orokani warriors are actually unique to Cand that is an a Candish only Orokani unit um, and they have a kind of eastern eastern theme to the dwarven design you also get blacklock engineers as you can see the orokani hall can be built in all the places that it can for the dwarves so it's stelatsakand amukand oibamari and then i believe possibly mataram as well but after that you've got to make it all the way up to the mountains so you'll only actually really get it in your heartlands all the way back here so the benefit is it's a solid benefit getting dwarven units because as we'll see in the second half of this roster infantry is where Cand really suffers so getting dwarven infantry is a huge boost but they only come from your furthest eastern provinces which are always the furthest from your front line because you can't go any further away so you'll you'll get these good units but they'll be miles away and you have to walk them through your army you also get the Ushishia Storm Riders, which is a fantastic chariot unit, which we shall see in the second half of this video. And that comes to you as well if you side with the Blue Wizards. There are a lot more rewards if you side with the Blue Wizards, but it's much more challenging. Because the alternative is that you say, no, Palando and Alatar, I'm going to stand with Sauron, the true and one lord, and I shall reject you and your armies and we shall trample you beneath our hooves. That option is slightly easier. Your nation does not rebel against you, your culture does not change, and Kanta joins you and you get the Temple Knights that he has as his bodyguard, and you get his army of Temple Wards, Temple Marksmen, and Great Beasts, but you have to fight off the two Blue Wizard armies. But two armies are much easier to face than losing four of your regions and your culture changing. So that side is easier if you stay allied to Sauron. The rewards for staying with Sauron is, as we've just seen there, in Stelatsakand only, so it can only be built here, you get the Inquisition, Inquisitor's Watch and Inquisitor's Headquarters. And these two buildings allow you to train Temple Wards, Temple Marksmen, and then finally Great Beasts. So you get some pretty nifty units, but from only one location. The other benefit of siding with Sauron is that with the Numenorians now coming and sort of taking control of your nation, they also teach your people a more sedentary lifestyle and they allow you to build cities. So if you side with Sauron, then your people will basically stop being nomads. You will accept this as the region you're going to live in. The, and so with the aid of the Numenorians, you will build proper cities. Uh, so you get cities and you get the Numenorians and you get great beasts. But otherwise the campaign if you reject the Blue Wizards is very similar to a normal Candish campaign. You've then got to just fight against Gondor and Dol Amroth who are miles away and you've got to make your way over there to get to them. Now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, ah, but Gallo, what if I attacked Mordor early? Well, if you attack Mordor, Harad, or Rune before the Blue Wizards arrive, the game will automatically declare you as allied to the Blue Wizards. So if you play your hand, so to speak, before they arrive, then you will be forced down whichever path you've already chosen. So if you wish to side with Sauron, you cannot be at war with him when the Blue Wizards come. I think it is Harad, Sauron, or Rune, though. Um... 
for that part I didn't check I'm afraid it may it's certainly Mordor if you're at war with Mordor then the, you will side with the blue wizards whether you want to or not and if you are at peace with Mordor then I believe that I think it is just Mordor that matters so you might be able to backstab Rune and Harad but then Mordor might attack you if you backstab Rune or Harad so that may not be the best course of action to, anyway if you are going for a Mordor playthrough. So those are the Blue Wizards and that is the Candish playthrough. Now just before I jump over to the battle map, um, Cand as a whole, um, just I shall say it here and, and, and end it here, what I would do with Cand, and I would love to do because I think it would be far, far better use of this place because I just think Cand is far too far away for anyone to actually enjoy it. Uh, I think Cand should be removed as a faction and I think they should come in much like the Mongols do in the base game or the, I believe, is it the Timurids as well? They invade. And in, to my thinking, if you were playing as an evil nation, so Harad, Mordor or Rune, then the Cand would come, a, a huge Candish army would come and the Blue Wizards would be leading it. And if you were playing as Gondor or Dol Amroth or Dorwinian, then a large Candish invasion would come, but it would be allied to Mordor and Rune and Harad. Um, and then if you're playing as anyone else, there'd be 50-50 as to whatever it would do. Uh, I would also then put the entire Candish roster as mercenaries and have them available from this region for absolutely anybody who makes it over here. Um, now that is just a very, very, very basic thought process of what I would do. But personally, I think Cand is possibly a waste of a unit of a faction slot, and um, I think they make the South unnecessarily weighted against Gondor and Dol Amroth. And I think by removing Cand would solve all of Dol Amroth's woes, uh, and it would make the Gondor campaign a touch simpler as well because they'd only have Harad, the Arzanaim, and Mordor to face. They wouldn't have Cand as well. Um, but also, I just don't think many people play as Cand because I think it's far too far away to actually enjoy it because you spend most of the campaign moving troops from east to west and you spend a lot of time just waiting. But that isn't set in stone. I just wanted, while we're talking about Cand, to say what I would do with them. But I'm routinely um, beaten down on, on those suggestions by the modding team. So it hasn't been done yet. But anyway, that's the um, campaign map for Cannes. Now let's jump over to the battle map and see what their roster looks like. Welcome then to the battle map for Cannes. So a quick overview shows you that you are a massively cavalry heavy faction. Uh, and with a quick look at the cards as well, there's a bit of a focus on cavalry archers. In terms of other archers, archers, that's not a word. In terms of other archers, there are three options, but they lean more toward the early game than the late so your archers are quickly outclassed. And down the middle, in terms of infantry, there are very few options indeed. Very, very few options, in fact. Massive cavalry-focused faction. But unlike Rohan, who are just sort of all-round cavalry nation, you are very much a horse archer nation. Uh, and your cavalry it can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Amrothian um, cavalry. You're not as good as them. And you don't have as many options as Rohan. But no one has better cavalry archers than you do. So that's your strength and your focus. But if we start, as we always do, with your melee trash, and you do get trash, but they look absolutely fantastic. They are the Step Tribesmen, one of the more unique looking units in the entire mod, if you ask me. Um, they are a nuisance, to be honest. I call them trash, and they are garbage trash, but they have a javelin, and it's a real pain in the neck, because if you let them get their javelins off, they have a six missile damage with their javelins, which is quite annoying. Um, they have a melee attack of only two though, and they're spearmen when they finish with their jabs. Five defense, so absolutely rubbish stats otherwise. I, I mean, obviously they're better than orcs, but everything's better than orcs. Uh, or goblins rather, sorry. Uh, but on the whole, they're not going to really do all that much. Poor morale, poor morale response, no movement speed changes. They don't like barren or grassland, or rather they like barren and grassland because they're nomads. They don't like the winter because they come from the hot steppe and the desert lands to the south. Uh, they get a bonus against mounts, as you'd expect. They have spears and javelins, and both of those are good against mounts. Two missiles, me missiles? Two me me missiles. Two missiles, 55 meter range, and high uh, average accuracy. I'm all over the place today. It's because I've just lost Valencia as El Cid. That's why it's, it's playing in the back of my mind. I shouldn't have lost. It was stupid. Uh, anyway, um, so those are the step tribesmen. They are supported by your first archer as well. And as I say, Cannes ground archers, heavy focus toward the early game. And one of them is, is just useless. Step archers are just useless. Again, though, I do make the point there are 177 of them. Two missile damage for 177 will actually do some damage. But 
their defense against returning arrow fire is non-existent. They have one armor stat, which means any enemy archer in the early game will likely outclass them and will be able to bring them down. And also cavalry, who is of course the bane of archers, will also drop them no trouble. So whilst you the player might actually get some use out of step archers if you can keep them safe, uh, when you're playing against Canned, this unit is is just one you can always disregard. It dies to basically anything that is thrown at it. It's a very poor unit. Uh, the cost unfortunately varies and varies because they're mercenary units and that's the way the system displays them. You'd also get a starting cavalry unit and this is one that I have labelled trash more times than I care to mention because they really are just damned awful. But every now and then, a bit like the farmhand pikemen actually, every now and then there's a battle, one type of battle, where this unit suddenly kills half your army out of absolutely nowhere. But then in the next battle they'll go back to being just absolute dire. Um, absolutely dire, sorry. They have an attack of three and a charge of four, which are both poor, and their defense, which is a killer for Cav, is only five. They are so, so, so bad if the enemy has any bite to them at all. So against Mordor, for example, you'll probably be alright, because their early tier units don't have bite. But if you're fighting Dol Amroth or Gondor, their marauders, their only purpose is to chase down routing units or charge into the back of units so that they are not at risk of dying. Because if they are at risk of dying, they will die, because they're damned poor. <laughs> And then we move on to the units that will start to actually do something, and these are the Nomads. So Nomad Axemen, Nomad Warriors, Nomad uh, Horsemen, supported by the Candish units as well. So we'll start with the Nomad Warriors because they're the um, sort of down the line one. Nomad Warriors are a sword and board with a six attack and a three charge with nine total defense. Uh, they cost 610, which is something in, uh, you'll see throughout the Cairns roster. They're rather cheap. Um, average morale, average morale response, 100% movement speed, and then the bonuses and malices we've seen before. But again, the units are relatively cheap for what you get. This unit is as good as Gondor Militia, so that's the same sort of tier that they're coming in at. Um, so, useful. They're a useful ground unit. The Nomad Axemen are a really useful ground unit because, of course, they're armor-piercing strike infantry. So, effective against armor, 5 attack, 4 charge, 7 defense. Now, they're not very good strike infantry. Um, units from Dunland and Ennard Wythe, for example, have charge bonuses in the 7 and 8s, and their attack of 7 and 8s as well, I believe. Um, so, as far as berserkers go, they're a little more muted than others, but they still have the role of being a berserker, and you can't take that away from them. As long as you're flanking an enemy, hitting them in the side or the back, this unit will do well. And they're not too expensive either. Supporting them is a unit we have seen before because they're available for you if you play as Rune as well. And they are the Candish Hunters. But of course you're very available as Cand because they're Candish Hunters. Melee attack of 4, total offense of 8, missile of 3. Now their armor is 3 times as good as the unit before them. But again, this unit is actually quite a good archer because 3 missile attack is not to be scoffed at. That is actually a good amount of damage. And with 150 of them as well, they'll do something about it. But... With a three armor stat, they will die to enemy arrow fire. And with an overall defense of only eight as well, they will basically die to anything that does attack them. So even though they are relatively solid units, I mean, a defense of eight and attack of four, if they do get into melee, they will probably be all right. But if cavalry hits them or archers shoot back at them, they will just melt away. So you do be, have to be very, very careful. But you don't need to worry too much because this is where your first cavalry archer comes in. The dismounted one's counterpart, the Candish Raiders. Cavalry archers are fantastic in this game when controlled by a human player. Providing you've got the patience to micromanage a cavalry army because they do require a lot of uh, babysitting. They get a bonus against other cavalry. They can form a shooting circle or a Cantabrian circle. Uh, they have a four missile attack, so one more than their dismounted counterpart, reflecting the fact that canned are horse archers primarily. They have 120% movement speed, so they're 20% faster than anyone else. Um, bonuses in Baron and Grass, Unstant Forest and Snow, la 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 la. They have 32 missiles, 130 meter range and high accuracy. They also get a bonus against mounts, so they are an anti-cavalry cavalry archer, which is very, very handy. Their cost isn't too bad for what they do. Um, I can't recall what their cost actually is, but it is not too expensive. Uh, I think it's around 700 or so. But they're a very good entry-level cavalry archer. Something else worth noting for Cand is that Cand have the most accurate cavalry archers of anybody in the game. So similarly to the Elves, where it says accuracy high, 
They have the highest accuracy within the high category for any cavalry archer. Um, so, well, as I say, with the elves, the elves are always more accurate for every tier than everyone else. So an average accuracy archer and an average accuracy elven archer, the elven one would actually be more accurate. And it's exactly the same thing here. So Khan's horse archers are all more accurate at every single stage, which is handy and makes them very, very, very lethal. And supporting the Candice Raiders are the first real delegated cavalry nomad horsemen. They actually have a spear which is, helps them out greatly and will indeed increase their charge in future versions. They have an attack of 5 and a charge of 6 with a defense of 10, so double the defense of the marauders. Nomad horsemen will actually get really good kills on the battlefield if used um, properly as a cavalry unit should. Charging, running away, charging, running away. Nomads will actually do the job. Which is good because I'm fairly certain the barracks event then comes in after that, so they're the only units you're going to be using for a while until you jump up to the Variag units. So the Variag swordsmen are the first ones to come in and the Variag swordsmen are two-handed swords. They're not effective against armor but they have an 11 attack, 6 charge and a 14 defense. They are solid ground infantry and they will hold the line relatively well so your cavalry has enough time to do some killing. Supporting the Variag Swordmen are Variag Bowmen, your last ground archer. Variag Bowmen only have a missile attack of 5. So you're very similar to Dol Amroth actually in that your best archer is not really all that great because you're not an archer nation. You are a cavalry archer nation as I've said about 7 times. Their melee attack is 7, their defense is 13. So if they are caught short and the enemy does ride up and meet them or rather run up and meet them, then they will be able to actually fight back for a time. They have bows, um, they have bows, of course they do their archers. They have shields and they have swords as well, which is very handy. It's nice having a shield. Uh, 28 missiles, 180 meter range, high accuracy, and they cost just shy of a thousand. So this is where Cairns, um, in a lack of sort of elites, comes in, is that your middle tier units are starting to get quite costly at nearly a thousand pound, a pound gold, just for your middle tier units. But supporting the Variags are then the three options at this tier. There are Variag Horse Archers, Wind Riders, and Variag Lancers. We'll start with the Horse Archers. Variag Horse Archers are just a direct upgrade, a phrase I use a lot, of Candish Raiders. So where the Raiders were 448, these are 6614. So better melee, better range, slightly better charge as well, I think. Five, yeah, it goes up to five. And the defense of 14. So a very, very good unit. They still suffer though. This formation that they are in, and this unit is also in, is really very good for them as cavalry archers, but it's awful for them as normal cavalry. So this formation is rubbish when you charge into the enemy. Um, it, it dissipates your charge bonus quite substantially and you lose a lot of oomph from your charge, but it works much better when they are actually shooting at the enemy because and it also helps them not get killed very easily cavalry archers are a prime target for the ai they love shooting cavalry archers and so this formation allows them to stay alive because you have to get very close to your enemy to shoot them you'll know our range is only 130 for our middle tier cavalry archer so this default horde formation protects them from arrow fire but it does make them pretty useless as actual charging cavalry and unfortunately you cannot swap between the two Bizarrely, the game doesn't allow that feature, and I've never understood why, because you can put certain units into the wedge formation, or I think we took it out of the game, because the AI uses it, and it's actually a really garbage formation, and it totally neuters the AI's cavalry, so we removed it. But it is a feature, so one wonders why they didn't put the horde or not horde mode as a feature as well, because then you could quite easily swap your cavalry archers from the archer formation into a charging formation. Although now I'm saying it out loud, I'm, then we might be able to look into doing something about that. Because if the wedge formation exists, then perhaps a square formation, we could, we could make it. But anyway, I'll look into that later. But so it's just a point to note that horse archers, whilst being fantastic horse archers for Cand, they're not very good charging into the enemy. So you need to use something else. But something else comes for Cand in this tier in the form of wind riders and lancers. We'll start with the lancers. Variag lancers are your first really heavy hitting unit. So a defense of 18 means they will survive very well in the charge. And they have a charge of 11 as well, which is fantastic. Remember that the charge changes haven't are not yet applied to version 4.5, so their charge is just 11 at the moment. And their attack is 8, which is damned good. They have an actual lance, which helps on the charge as well. Good morale, impetuous morale response, 10% speed boost can are faster than other cavalry nations as well. Their secondary attack is only 7 though, so 1 down from their charging attack. A very good unit, but quite costly at 1,250. 
Um, and particularly given that they're not even your latest, your elites yet. Now the Windriders of Kand are a very, very unique unit. They are the singularly fastest unit in the entire game. Nothing can catch a Windrider of Kand, and this is the bodyguard of your faction heir. Now their attack is 11, but note they use swords, not spears or lances. They have a charge bonus of 5 and a defense of 15. So they are the closest thing you've got to a dedicated melee cavalry, really, because of that very high attack, but a lower charge. That that incentivizes you to charge into the enemy and then wait there for a little while whilst you get some you make use of that high attack uh, and then you want to pull out anyway because even though they have a sword cavalry should always be hit and run hit and run but they have a movement speed of 140 percent they use the unbarded horse so this horse is running animation is slower than the normal horse anyway um so which means that this horse is already the fastest horse and add that 40% boost to it They're a very fast unit. In fact the fastest as I've already mentioned They get a bonus against mounts as well. They are designed to be a cavalry killer You can hit the enemy cavalry long before it gets anywhere near your line Keep it pinned down keep it busy your high attack of 11 means you're likely to win in cavalry fights Because most cavalry have relatively low attack, but a higher charge whereas you have that flipped so if you can catch the enemy cav, you will slaughter them. They're fantastic against cavalry. That is their raison d'etre. And I would recommend using them to do that. Against infantry, obviously, they do still serve a purpose. They're cavalry. But um, always charge them in and out. Charge them in and out. So that's your third tier. And then we come to your elites. Starting off with the Warlord's Guard, because they're available everywhere. The Warlord's Guard, you may have been very surprised to learn, actually made it into the top 10 strike infantry. Um, so whilst Can don't have fantastic infantry, their best unit is one of the best of its tier in the whole game, which is pretty damned good. They inspire your forces, they're armor piercing, they have a 9 attack, a 7 charge and a 20 total defense. Uh, they only cost 1,170, which isn't too bad. They hold their axes in a very silly place though, don't they? That he's going to lose control of that. Uh, morale is very good, morale response is good, movement speed of 100%. You'll note that so far nothing has had outstanding morale. You are not a high morale nation. You are press ganged into war, really, and you are lovers of cavalry. And so if the situation goes poorly, you just simply run away. You are nomads. You do not need to worry. Although, of course, because nomads you can't be a thing in Medieval 2 very easily, um, you're not really nomads. But um, run away if the battle isn't going too well. So your speed is your ally. But it does mean that your forces aren't particularly set up to fight to the death. Supporting the Warlord's Guard, if you side with the Blue Wizards, this unit is not present in any other roster because it is a Candish only unit, which is why it's here, are the Orokani Warriors. So Orokani Warriors are also a dedicated charging unit with an attack of 8, a charge of 6 and a total defense of 20. They are only slightly worse than the Warlord's Guard, but they come with the benefit of being dwarves, so they have excellent morale. Good morale response, but they move a bit slower. But it just gives you two very late game armor piercing options. Which is kind of, again, lends itself well to Khan Can, Khan's ethos, which is that you're not really a ground infantry nation, but the few ground infantry units you do have fulfill roles that your cavalry simply cannot fulfill. And in that, this case, that is essentially armor piercing. Um, you've got those two obviously are armor piercing. You've got the Nomad Axemen at the start are armor piercing. And then, well, that unit throws javelins anyway, so that's discounted. And the other two have very. Um, are just basically filler kind of units, if you will. But armor piercing is very much your ground units thing, um, which is just a nice little addition for you. It means that whilst your ground infantry isn't fantastic, it does pack a bit of a punch. But speaking of fantastic, we come then to Khan's late game. Warlords, Cataphract, Archers, and Warlords, Cataphracts. Uh, and these units are very, very good indeed. So we'll start with the Cataphract Archers. So first thing you'll note is that they are not in Horde formation. So they will actually charge quite nicely once they have finished with their arrows. But it'll take them a while to do that because they have 36 missiles. So they'll be firing for a long old time. Their accuracy is high. And again, that is high Candish accuracy. So they are in fact the most accurate horse archer in the game. 140 meter range, which is slightly better as well. They get a movement speed bonus of 105%. They have a missile attack of 8, a melee attack of 7, and a defense of 16. Now that missile attack of 8 is outstanding. They are archers, remember, not crossbows. And there are some crossbow units that don't even have that high of an attack. So that 8 missile is formidable. They are such a deadly cavalry archer unit. And when they finish firing, 
With a defence of 16 and a melee of 7, they will at least survive long enough to do something. And note that their total defence, 12 of that is armour. So they will fight, they will survive if the enemy shoots them. Uh, they do cost 1,400 though, so they're very costly. But they are an absolutely amazing cavalry archer unit. And one you should always go for. They are not only your best cavalry archer, they are your best archer full stop. The only downside to them is they have to get quite close to the enemy because their range is still only 140. Uh, so they will get shot back at, but with a 12 armor stat, they're, they're primed and ready to do that. And then we come to the Warlord's Cataphract, your best charging cavalry. So an 11 attack, a 12 charge, a defense of 22, they will hit like hammers um, and then be able to pull out and go again. They are um, only really just slightly better than the Lancers, um, but you only have to pay 150 more for them for quite a few more boosts throughout. A um, couple more points of armor and a better attack and one better charge. But also they frighten the enemy when they charge into them, which helps a great deal. Uh, they have a slight movement speed boost of 5% and very good morale with an impetuous morale response. A very, very good cavalry unit and being slightly faster than other cataphract-esque cavalry. I'm thinking Lok Inas Rim, I'm thinking Knights of the Silver Swan, Knights of the Tirith Ayar. Uh, being faster than all of those gives you a slight edge if you do find yourself in cavalry combat. Um, they will be the fastest of all of those. And the last unit that you can get again, this is awarded to you if you side with the Blue Wizards, and these are the Ushisha Storm Riders. Uh, and they are a solid, as you can see, chariot unit. Uh, melee attack of 14, missile attack of 14, which is fantastic, charge of 20, and total defense of 16 with three hit points. Remember that as chariots, though, they are good. Um, they're excellent if the enemy doesn't have any ranged units, because you can just follow the enemy around and kill them with your insanely high crossbow missile attack. So you're, you have armor-piercing attacks. You um, get a bonus against mounts, as you can see as well. You frighten the enemy as well, and you inspire yourselves and your nearby allies, which is pretty handy. And now, if memory serves, their arrow... It um, Originally it was body piercing, but I don't know if Hummingbird turned that off. Um, but I, I think it may still be body piercing. But they only have 110 meter range, so the lowest of any of your cavalry archers. But they do have high accuracy with 20 missiles. They get a bonus against mounts, as I've already mentioned. And there are 20% movement speed buff on other chariot-esque units. Um, as chariots, though, do not let them get shot at because they will die in seconds. They just have almost no defense to arrow fire because of their ridiculous hitbox. So almost an entire, if 120 men shot their arrows at these people, then almost every single one of those arrows will hit. And that quickly adds up. And even though they have the three hit points, giving them effectively nearly um, 50 total defense, they will actually just sh get shredded. They die really quickly. So don't let them get shot at. Keep them away from the enemy, harass the enemy if possible, but if that fails, just run them backwards and forwards through the enemy line, disrupting them as they go. And lastly, your bodyguard is, rather fittingly, a cavalry archer and retains the old design of the Candish Brotherhood units. This is what your elite units used to look like. Um, as much as I am pleased that we've kept the old design indeed in the horse and in the rider, I do think this actually stands out now as the singularly worst looking unit in the roster. Um, the helmet looks pretty cool, and I like the, the sort of designer motif there, but it just cuts off out of nowhere, and then you go to this sort of just black mash of nothingness. Um, I was very pleased when these units were changed. If you compare them even to just the lowly Nomad Warrior, for example, I think the quality of that unit is far outshines the um, bodyguard. Now, I'm not raining on anyone's parade. The, the um, design of this unit was created years ago, and as you can see, they have been replaced through the entire roster. Um, uh, with the only v other vestige is that the Variag Lancers, whilst having the much better um, silver horse, still have in their picture the black one, um, which ideally we'd change if we can, because the black one, I think, just looks really poor, and I, I'm, I've never been keen on that. But anyway, I should stop crapping all over the unit and just tell you what they're like. Uh, they inspire your forces, they're skilled against mounts, they're effective against armour with their arrows, which is pretty useful. They're very good against um, killing Dole Amroth's bodyguards, I can tell you that for free. Um, that's one of their primary roles really. 8 melee, 6 missile, 5 charge, 19 defense. They're a very good little unit. There are about 20 of them on average, but that will rise for your faction leader and heir if you do get the one with the wind riders killed. Their morale is very good, morale response is good. 20% movement speed, so they are not much can catch them. Um, 36 missiles, 140 on the meters, and high accuracy. So they are a very good cavalry archer, 
but they're let down by the fact there's not very many of them, but they're boosted by the fact that their bows do armor piercing damage. So do utilize them against high value targets because that's where they will excel. And that is Khan's roster. Um, very, very, very cavalry orientated, but you've got to fight with the fact that you start absolutely miles away from anybody and anything. And that the campaign, unfortunately, is a bit of a slog as you fight your way across to the Western Front. Once you can get established in the West, then you're all right. Um, you'll be on the border, or indeed to the North. You might want to go for Dorwinian instead of Gondor or Dol Amroth. Uh, and you're well within your right to do that. But once you get established either to the west or the north, then the campaign is, becomes a bit easier and a bit more fun because you're not just running units from your homeland to the front. Um, but then, of course, the Blue Wizards will strike and you've got to know what you're going to do about them. And there we are. That is Cairns roster. Now, as I said last week, there are now only two episodes left. One is Dunland and one is Isengard. And we won't play the game because it is Dunland and Isengard are going to be last. So the great yellow and grey armies of Dunland amass on the field before us. Dunland are probably actually quite a good match for Cairns. Because Dunland do get quite a few anti-cavalry units of course. Because their chief adversary is a famously cavalry orientated nation. There's the Ushishia crushing some war chanters. But it looks like they may have already taken one or two losses. Um, something was hit by the, uh, the catapult really badly over there, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, the Ushishia have gone up against Guardians of Dunland, which cannot help, but they are shaken. They are shaken, but there we are. The first one's gone, the second one's gone. There's now only four of them as they blast their way into these Dunlending Raiders. See, that is how you were to use Chariot. But now they've stopped them. That's such a bad decision. Go on, keep going, keep going. Yes. Now, it doesn't actually do any damage, as you can see. Every single one of those units has stood back up again, but it delays them drastically. It stops them running, and it will make them targets for archers and all kinds of things like that. Um, but it is one of the best ways of using chariots. Um, and, of course, they do fire as they are charging around as well, so there's always that to note as well. They are mobile missile warriors. We've got some fighting going on over here. The Dunlending Cavalry thinks it can go up against Warlord's Cataphract Archers. But unfortunately, no matter, despite how good Eisenmach Raiders actually are, they're no match for Khan's elite cavalry. Ah, but our general has fallen, which is very disappointing. But indeed, it will be a Dunland next week, and as I say, there are only two episodes left. I don't know what I will do filling the slot that has been taken up these past 26 weeks, or 24 weeks. Um, I don't know what we'll replace it with, but we'll worry about that in time. But for now, that concludes. So thank you very much for watching, if indeed you have. And in case you haven't seen um, the Dol Amroth episode yesterday, number four, I mentioned that we were thinking of changing the name. Or rather, I should be blunt, I was thinking of changing the name. And doing away with Divide and Conquer and calling us Middle Earth Total War because we are now a standalone mod. And it would be nice to have a Lord of the Rings themed name like Third Age Reforged or Third Age Total War. Um, so we could be Middle Earth Total War. Uh, but various points have been raised that I think have some merit. Various points have been raised that I don't think have any merit and are purely emotional. But in any event, the name Divide and Conquer will stay. So until we speak again, dear friends, Navar, Naden, Penemad, Malunin, and farewell.